Okay, can everybody see that? Yes. yes. That's good. Well, Katie, thank you. First of all, I thought I'd put a provocative title on the presentation to get your attention about the six pills that doctors, even good doctors, uh, generally don't prescribe, can't prescribe, and don't know much about. And so my punchline here is you have to teach your doctor. Uh, I'll give you examples of how I've worked with and empowered coal miners in West Virginia to teach their doctor how to get them off of insulin because frankly, they didn't want to be on insulin anymore. <clears throat> but they did it through their own behaviors and essentially taking charge of their own health care, not out of uh, lack of trust in their physicians, but frankly, as physicians, we didn't learn this science. And I want to give you a perspective now as someone who's been a physician for quite a number of years uh, on my personal journey uh, going through the military, through civilian health care, and now working with a variety of large organizations, startup companies, entrepreneurs, what really matters here? So way in the upper corner, you can see a much ver earlier version of me just up in the next state in uh, Fayetteville, North Carolina, nearby you guys, when I was a young flight surgeon working for C-130 Squadron. And my office was the airplane. My office was the runway. It was the squadron building. Oh yeah, I had to do work in the hospital. I had to do the clinic. But what I understood is that health doesn't live in a medical clinic and that medicine is best practice outside the walls of a hospital. Um, for 20 years in the military, my job was not to just see sick people, but to make the unit perform. And I think you as an individual and you as wishing for your kids and your grandkids, what you really want them to do is perform at their peak ability. And what medicine too often does, in my opinion, is we put, just put a patch and we don't talk about performance of the long view. So I've always had the long view because that's what I was told to do for two decades in the military, to fly, fight, and win. Um, many good times passing through Charleston Air Force Base, by the way, as I mentioned to Bruce. But we always were a single payer. We didn't get any more money because people were sicker. And as a matter of fact, it was not uncommon for me to fire hospital commanders because they were sending too much care downtown when they should have been taking care of it or get, getting people healthier on the Air Force Base. Um, I was so frustrated with civilian health care, the more I learned about it, that we started up our own health plan that said, we're going to pay 100% for the preventive care. We're going to show you the price of a Z pack. We're going to show you the price of a doctor's visit, because heaven forbid, it's not a $10 copay. It's $135, and it's all your money. It's just coming out of different pockets. So we started health savings accounts in 2004, 2005 with the Secretary of the Treasury and the IRS. I was there, if you can find the old video, when he turns to me in 2007 and says, now tell me, Dr. Mike, why is knowing the price of health care good for medicine and good for my health? Um, boy, did the health plans hate that. Hospitals didn't like it either. A lot of doctors who were never told what they were being charged, they were wising up. Very interesting time in my life. We got acquired by a large Blue Cross plan. And it was clear to me that after two years there by obligatory stay, I had to leave because there was too much lack of transparency and too little emphasis on prevention, to be honest with you. Um, along the way, I've worked with every possible player. I worked on Capitol Hill for two years in the Senate Health Subcommittee. I've worked with unions. I've worked with organized medicine as a delegate to the AMA. Institute of Medicine, I now advise DOD on health and medical readiness issues. So I come with a deep, broad, and I think informed perspective, personal, albeit, about what's really important, what's not. And at the end of the day, there's one and only one person who cares about your health as much as you do. It's you. It's not your doctor. It might be your spouse if you're lucky to have one. It's maybe your children. But at the end of the day, if we don't get our own personal house in order and understand what causes disease, what unwinds disease and what we can do in partnership with our doctor, not our God, she's our partner. What can we do together to make it, to make it so we live the longest, healthiest life possible? I dug back into my archives, Katie, and I found this slide probably, I would say, this was around the early 1990s when we realized that the so-called annual physical was largely a waste of time and energy on both the patient and the doctor point. Uh, we'll talk more about it in Q&A if you want. But essentially what we were telling the chief of staff of the Air Force, so this is a slide given to a four-star. When you talk to a four-star in the E-ring of the Pentagon, it's very simple. You get your point across in five minutes because invariably there's some crisis that comes out 
and he's going to have to leave. So I put up this cutaway of the F-100 engine, which those of you who have Air Force experience, this is what powered the F-15, the F-16. Every aircraft pilot in the Air Force knows this engine by heart, and they know all the components in that engine in this cutaway view. Essentially, all of the parts are examined, not 100% end-to-end, -end, year after year. They are evaluated based on how many flying hours that engine has been subjected to. Certain parts of this wear out at certain number of flying hours. General, it would be a waste of time if we inspected all the parts every year without any attention to how many flying hours or the experience of that particular engine. All I'm asking for a more rational periodic health exam program is to do the same thing for this engine, the human being who has organ systems that wear down at different use flying hours, if you will. In seven minutes, I got the approval for the program. I say this because in medicine, one of the biggest problems we have is expressing concepts which you should own as the owner of your engine, getting it out of the medical gobbledygook and talking about what are the simple things you can do using nouns, verbs, adjectives, objects, right? So I want you to know today I'm gonna to give you six things that will improve your human system performance that your doctor either doesn't know about, was not trained in, and now is beginning to learn that you can help energize yourself uh, going forward. For 25 years, I've used this slide and I've asked employers and I've asked uh, large community groups and I've asked health plans, how many people in the room or how many people in your company can say yes to these five questions? I'm not gonna read them. There's nothing on here about your genetics. There's nothing on here about your health plan coverage. There's nothing on here about what doctors in your network. There's simple five questions. And every year I've been practicing medicine since I graduated medical school, the number of Americans who answered yes to these five questions has declined, such that today, fewer than 5% of Americans can answer yes to all five. None of them have anything to do with my genetics. They have everything to do with culture, everything to do with my environment, everything to do with, well, the fact that we tried to medicalize these. They're not medical. It's public health, it's family health, it's school health, it's work health, it's community health in your community. So I was visiting one of our hospitals in Western Pennsylvania about five years ago. After I had a staff meeting with all the physicians, we were driving out of the hospital and a hundred yards away from the hospital, I passed this store. This is the dream store for anybody who wants to end life early and broke. It's called Habits. I can get my beer, I can get my smokes, and I can get my lottery tickets in one easy stop. And it was kind of the ultimate irony because as a country, this is what we do. We have a habit store right up the street from a hospital and somehow we're supposed to fix it. When I showed this to my colleagues back at the health plan in Pittsburgh, I said, there's a lot of challenges with this slide. Wouldn't you agree? And Bob, who was one of the nurses that I worked with, he said, I'll tell you, there's a lot of problems with this slide, Dr. Mike. You see that 30 pack Coors Light? He says, I can get that for $15 in Pittsburgh. Yeah, <laughs> always looking for a good deal. Always looking for a good deal. So in a 13 minute typical doctor visit, and that's all you're gonna get by the way, 13 minutes. An overweight doctor and an overweight patient, here's the conclusion. Uh, give it to me straight doc. How long do I have to ignore your advice? Now, in reality, this New Yorker cartoon is not what patients say to me. But they'll sit there nodding their head going, yes, I'll do this. Yes, I'll do this. Yes, I'll do this. And in, deep in their psyche, they're saying, there's no way in hell I'm going to do that. It's hard to do that. And that's why both players here, both the overweight doctor and the overweight patient, are frustrated with the status quo. Doctors reach for the prescription pad. They call it the McLibitor syndrome because they know patients think that anything they eat or any way they behave, I can fix with a pill. And besides, I don't have the time. I kind of heard this stuff works. I don't really believe it. Um, even though I know scientifically behavior change like plant-based eating, physical activity, stress management, good sleep, all of those things can work as well or better as medications. And that is the honest to God's truth. The pharmaceutical company doesn't want you to know that, but it's absolutely true. We'll cover some of that today. This is the new Rosetta Stone of, as far as I'm concerned, the entire practice of medicine. 
I was honored to leave the National Lifestyle Medicine Research Summit in late December of 2019. 50 of the nation's experts in clinical disease, in basic science, in uh, lifestyle medicine from the US and other countries came together and said, what is the basic science? What is the clinical evidence? And what is the common pathway to create all these diseases on the right-hand side? Obesity, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, stroke, cancer, depression. It's inflammation. If James Carville, you remember who he was, it would be, doctor, it's inflammation, stupid. But it all starts on the far left of this slide with what you chose to do this morning. Did you wake up and get physically active? Did you eat a plant-based meal? Did you say prayers? Did you connect with somebody? Did you walk outside, take in the sunshine or the vitamin D? These six pills on the left side, we now know are changed through the microbiome, through epigenetics, and through cellular stress and injury, none of which was taught to me in medical school or two residencies. It is the emerging, dramatic, exciting science of neuroplasticity, epigenetics, and the microbiome. This is what's new. And the good news is, when you see those little brown boxes at the bottom, lifestyle interventions shift this entire diagram back to the left. Not only does it prevent, but it also treats, and in italics in the title, actually reverses existing disease. Nothing we have with medication does that. Nothing. The problem is inflammation hides in all the specialty clinics. So all of these organ-specific diagnoses have doctors and clinics and billing codes attached to them. So I go see the ophthalmologist for macular degeneration, which is a reflection of, oh, by the way, what's happening with my diabetes. Uh, oh, what's happening in my liver, but that's because I'm overeating and the liver exam has to go to the hepatologist, even though I'm on my way to renal failure, which is right down the hallway from the nephrologist. And the GI specialist who of course looks over the liver doesn't talk to the nephrologist and I'm six different medications. This is the mess that patients experience. And I guarantee you, you or your family members are experiencing this. You are the patient ping pong ball going from specialist to specialist to specialist. And the root cause of the disease, those six pills on the left side of that chart have not been addressed. And yet you're way over beyond the epigenetics, the microbiome, the neuroplasticity, the cellular damage, the dysbiosis, the microbiome, all that stuff is not being addressed effectively as effectively as it could as you bounce around the system. This is the only scientific slide all night because it, sometimes I don't even understand basic science. Didn't exist when I graduated from medical school 45 years ago. Your genes are not your destiny. It is epigenetics, which is the expression of proteins from those methylation groups in the middle of the slide. And those are impacted by your development in utero. Yes, believe it or not, what experience your mothers had started to change the epigenetics to the fetus. What about environmental chemicals? What about diet? What about physical activity? What about other drugs you're taking that actually change the epigenetics? This is the core science that makes it so exciting. The six pills, which I'm gonna cover really quickly and give you a few pearls that you can take home. I'm not gonna spend much time because Katie tells me that a lot of your group is dedicated to plant-based eating and understanding that. I'm gonna spend time on sleep, regular physical activity, tobacco, alcohol, other addictions, stress management, positive psychology, and healthy social relationships. Remember McLipitor syndrome? The busy doctor who said, I just give Lipitor everybody because it's, I don't know that the other stuff works. I don't have time to do it anyway. So we went to our UPMC physician, some of the best physicians in the country in the Department of Internal Medicine. And I gave them this survey. And I said, what are the barriers, doctor, to you essentially addressing and helping your patients to quit smoke, lose weight, change their eating habits, manage stress, increasing physical activity? This is 20 physicians, some of the brightest in the country. And on a scale of one to 10, Look in the red circle of what were the biggest barriers. Number one is, I don't have any time. There's no time in a patient visit to talk about this stuff. But more importantly, I don't have the resources and I don't have the knowledge. I got one hour of medical school education about nutrition, over four years in medical school and seven, six to seven years of residency training. They don't know what they have to know. They don't have the resources to do it. They don't have the time. And look at the fourth one. I don't think the patients really wanna care about it. I don't believe it'll actually change behavior. 
So no, I'm not gonna do this. So this is why the growing number of doctors in lifestyle medicine, an article that I promoted, we pulled together all of these six medical specialties in 2009 when I was president of ACPM and said, send us the doctor in your specialty leadership who is the most motivated to learn about lifestyle and health behavior change. So we reached out to the pedi pediatricians, the family docs, the general internists, the sports medicine docs, preventive medicine physicians, just these little bit of lifestyle physicians back in 2009. And we created this article, which was published in the mainstream journal of the American Medical Association and said, these are the new competencies that physicians must have in order to address the patient need and in order to address the new science of what we're finding in these areas like epigenetics. That article kicked off a lot of the growth in the physician self-certifying in lifestyle medicine and in now 70 residency programs across the country offering curriculum that trains people in those six domains. Unheard of, didn't exist in 2010, tremendous progress in the last five years. So as I said, let's go through the six pills real quick. Questions to ask your doctor, things to help your spouse with, or please talk to your grandkids. They're less healthy today than you were 60 years ago. And I can say that nobody can qualify to get in the military nowadays. Four-star generals about seven years ago wrote a monograph on their retirement entitled Too Fat to Fight. Provocative, politically incorrect, but there are entire generations of kids that cannot go into the military because they cannot get through basic training. So the consumption of meat products in this country continues to skyrocket at over 220 pounds and going up. And we now know that chicken is no better than pork is no better than, but the beef, pork and chicken, the global impact on our health and on the environment continues to grow despite the evidence that it's not good for our health. This article was striking to me in 2016 and I show it to lay audiences like you because those bars with those dots show that when we take people and we switch them from the primary source of their protein coming from animals to that protein coming from plants, we reduce all cause mortality, meaning when you die and the causes of those mortality, be it cardiovascular disease, cancer and other inflammatory related deaths. And the dramatic result is 20 to 60%. Nobody sees those numbers in real clinical trials. Those are huge. The punchline here, which is one of the cornerstones of your group, as Katie expressed, is a whole food, plant-based eating pattern. I increasingly want to measure specifically how in the last bullet, by choosing better eating, you are improving the environment in South Carolina, you are reducing the carbon footprint, you are improving biodiversity and getting away from the universal three American food products, which is salt, sugar, fat, corn, and soybeans. All of those things are in our interest for our kids and our grandkids. This I just abstracted from an article of 21 physicians in California that came out in 2015. And they just said, it's very simple. Shift your entire diet from the left column to the right column, from inflammatory effects to anti-inflammatory effects. So this group of doctors, before we had the Lifestyle Medicine uh, Research Summit in 2019 was already saying it's inflammation stupid. You can unwind it by what you eat and one of the cornerstones of lifestyle medicine. So let's go through the other pills. Uh, we're still not active enough. 30 minutes to an hour of regular physical activity each and every day is your second pill. And it should be robust enough to get you winded slightly when you're walking, to generate about three mets of physical activity. Those of you who are sports trainers or physical therapists know what that is. Always walk the longest distance from the parking lot. Try to do it at a minimum in 10 minute bursts. That way you get some cardiovascular benefit. Uh, put down every remote in your house. Put big yellow tape across your couches and your seats, just like I told my parents <laughs> in Las Vegas. It's a police tape. There are dead people who sit in those things. Uh, remind yourself that you need to be moving and we'll have some fun stories later on. Some of my heroes to tell you some anecdotes and things to watch. And with regular physical activity, it doesn't have to be exercise. I don't use the word exercise. Exercise is a turnoff for other people. Our grandparents who might've been in Ireland or in Italy or in Asia, they didn't exercise. They just worked their buns off outside planting a good garden. Or as my 101 year old, 
Okinawan great great wife's grandfather did every day walk down the hill from Okinawa after a small breakfast, met at the men's club. Again, Y chromosome is deadly for most of us men. We don't socialize. He spent his day at the men club, taking walks, talking about Japanese baseball. Boy, you think American fans are rabid about baseball? You should follow it in Okinawa, Japan. So that's what we have to do is just get active. So while physical activity of any type is good, exercise is a subset of that that is purposeful and designed to improve fitness, which we also need. Moderate physical activity of three to five METs, and you can get a simple list of what those activities are. You don't have to be a jogger. You don't have to overstress yourself, but you do have to put some stress, mild stress, on your cardiorespiratory engine, which is your heart-lung unit. That's element number one. Here's some typical examples of what are moderate to vigorous activity levels. I highlight the, the third line. Notice that it says raking leaves, not blowing leaves, right? <laughs> I know you get leaves in South Carolina, so put away the blower, save the environment, and get that old rusty rake out that you were going to leave behind in Pennsylvania, okay? Tremendous exercise. Strength and flexibility, however, the other two components, and should be done at least two to three times a week. We do get muscle wasting as we age, and so you have to be able to put weight on those muscles regular conditioning at least two to three times a week and work systematically on your upper body, your core, and your lower body. Yoga, Tai Chi, floor exercises are tremendous exercises for strengthening. They're not wee-wee exercises, believe me. Those are hardcore exercises. If you've ever done it, you get winded and it builds great muscle. And then finally, with injuries, it's often due to lack of flexibility. So cardiorespiratory endurance, strength and flexibility, the iron triad of physical activity and fitness. And here's the bonus. Every single part of your body, every single place that blood flows in your body, most importantly to your brain, your mood, your, your cognitive ability, your risk of dementia, um, everything improves with exercise. Endorphins are released from the brain. You don't have to run a marathon to get a runner's high. You can get a walker's high, right? So every single part of your body benefits. Number three, reduce and eliminate substance use and abuse. And the big uh, violator here is not cigarettes, it's alcohol. We've given the alcohol industry a license to kill, literally. And I see so many people who still don't understand the danger. Each of you there, if I had to raise a hand in the audience tonight and say, how many of you have a, have a substance abuse family member? that you has broken your heart or you're breaking their heart for alcohol or eating disorders or morphine or some type of opiate, it's rife. Um, there are still people who smoke. It's unbelievable to me. But if you know anybody, if you see anybody, I mandate that you go up to them tomorrow morning and give them a big hug and say, Roberta, I love you. What can I do to help you quit? And go on the next day, go back on Saturday. Roberta, what can I do to help you quit? They need to know that the network of people around there with nicotine addiction, they can overcome it. Um, every single day they stop improves their health. Yeah, we have good data that 10 years out, the risk declines to that of a non-smoker, but every day their risk of ear infections, bad COVID infections or death, pneumonia, asthma, bronchitis, everything goes down, not to mention the cost on their pocketbook. As I said, the new studies show there is zero, literally zero benefit to alcohol consumption at any level. So anybody who essentially says, well, I need to get my two glasses of red wine a day. Uh, no, there's a lot, just eat the grapes, okay? Uh, alcohol, almost at any level, should at, be modestly consumed, if at all. If you don't drink, don't start. If you do drink, certainly no more than one to two a day one for women, two for men, except when the Steelers lose a game that they shouldn't, in which case you can do it. What about sleep? This, this is the fourth pill. It is absolutely undervalued and everybody is sleep deprived. Think back to seeing an infant or a young child sleep. That is a natural state that we're all capable of, that deep restorative and DNA and cellular repairing sleep. Sleep is when our body repairs itself. And if we're getting three, four, five hours of interrupted sleep, we never get to deep sleep, 
we don't turn on our parasympathetic nervous system and we're not able to repair our DNA. As a result, every day, the inflammation in our body increases. Every day that goes by, we're more inflamed. So getting that seven to eight hours of restorative sleep, you go to bed, you fall to sleep quickly, you may have to get up to urinate in the night, don't worry about it, but when you get up in the morning, you're refreshed, you're restored. Insomnia is a word that's thrown around a lot. I wanted to give you, show you here the actual medical definition of what insomnia really is. No question people will have trouble falling asleep if one of their loved ones is in trouble or they've just had a setback in their personal life. That's not insomnia. Insomnia is a consistent pattern of three nights a week for at least three months of difficulty initiating or staying asleep. And with every single month that goes by with sustained insomnia, there is whole body effects related to the, the increasing inflammation because it's a major pathway to inflammation. So Dr. Don Bicey, who's a sleep expert at the UPMC Medical Center, he likes to talk very simply with visuals, uh, all time related. What controls your personal sleep is the hourglass, the clock, and the alarm. So the first thing is, how long have you been awake? So in the Air Force, one of my jobs was to totally understand circadian rhythm on long air missions in a C-141, C-150, C-130, or C-5, right? What is the use of no and go, go, no go pills? When is it appropriate? When are they not? Because you can't fight mother nature. We are hardwired for a 24 hour rhythm when we're supposed to sleep. And when you try to push beyond that, there are physiologic effects that you cannot overcome. So how long you've been awake, awake and engaged is a major driver of when you should go to sleep. Number two is there's a reason that we feel sleepy when the sun goes down. And the reason why we shouldn't be exposed to blue light or unnatural sunlight after the sun goes down. We're now nibbling into, those of you who've been camping know, all of a sudden you find yourself sleeping at 6.30 at night when the sun goes down because guess what? I'm exhausted. I've been hiking all day. I just ate a good dinner. I'm not gonna stay up till 11 o'clock at night looking at my cell phone. So the circadian sleep propensity is again going to change your adrenal gland production of sleep inducing chemicals or alerting chemicals, right? along with the pineal gland, the hypothalamus. It's all a beautiful, elegant machine that the more we tinker with it, the more insomnia we're gonna have. And then finally, the tools that we need to control our level of arrival or our psychophysiological uh, state are the other pills in lifestyle medicine. I shouldn't be stirred up right before I go to sleep if there are things like exercise, plant-based eating, stress management techniques, or a social circle of friends that would make me be less aroused when it's time for me to go to bed. So what are the other tools in your toolkit to be able to do it? So keep a journal just for a week. What are your sleep times? Do you even know? What time do you go to bed, but what time do you actually fall asleep? What time do you get out of bed in the morning? What's the total time in bed versus the total time you're actually asleep when you subtract the time to get to sleep, the tossing and turning or the one hour that you get up and watch TV in the middle of the night. So what are you actually getting? shoot for seven to eight hours of restorative, reparative, deep sleep. So you get down into the area where your DNA is repaired, where your inflammation is unwound, where your sympathetic fight or flight nervous system is turned off. Reduce your time in bed, just use it for sleep. Get at the same time every day of the week, no matter how much you slept the night before. Patterns are important. Don't go to bed unless you're sleepy and don't stay in bed unless you're already asleep. Simple advice from Don. What about stress? This is a toolkit. Do you know how to recognize your personal stress, how to, how to be kind to yourself, to not judge yourself and to unwind? Do you know how? Katie's formula is not my formula. It's not Bruce's formula. It's not Len's formula. You've got to hold up a mirror to say, what are my stressors? How do I react? How do I control it? What's in my toolkit? What do I have to do? The best thing in your toolkit, believe it or not, is deep, rhythmic, regular breathing. But as my brother, who's a veterinarian, says, people don't breathe. They pant. I know the difference between a panting German shepherd and the way I should be breathing as a human being. Shallow breaths that don't fully inflate your lungs all the way out to those small aerials, all the way out of the end of your lungs, which, by the way, sets you up for things like COVID, 
and for pneumonia and for other types of infection because they're not being aerated. Do you know how to do it? Are you religious or are you spiritual? Are you connected to something bigger than yourself? I don't care about organized religion, but that's why people do it. They have a lot of consolation in that. Do you know how to contemplate, how to think through things? And can you relax? Can you practice just the way a football team would practice a certain type of play? Can you practice it? And can you do it again and again and again during the day as needed? Studies suggest that these approaches work better. Let me say it again work better than sleeping pills and antidepressants. Regular physical activity works better than the 40 to 50% of Americans now taking sleeping pills and antidepressants, but they don't do it. So two approaches I wanna uh, quickly cover tonight, I'm gonna focus mainly the one on the left on mindfulness. I encourage you if you're interested in a deeper dive into kind of a deep self exploration of your personality type, well beyond Myers-Briggs is the Enneagram personality type. And you can look that up on the web and you can take that, help you understand yourself better at any age. I think the older we get, we'd like to think we understand ourselves better, but I'm not sure that's the case. So mindfulness meditation has been studied after Benson at Harvard. I learned about the relaxation response when I was in medical school, when he found that meditation in Far Eastern countries and the Buddhists in particular, actually had a quieting effect on blood pressure levels, and on a wide variety of other skin potential as related to stress. But mindfulness is a way that is really generic and scientifically proven to have physical, emotional, and mental health benefits. As I said, Enneagram personality testing is a deeper dive that you may find useful, but both will improve almost immediately your sense of personal well being, your empathy for others, the lack of judgmentalism, and your own personal productivity and whatever's important to you, not to mention reduce inflammation. So Dr. Kabat-Zinn at the UMass developed mindfulness, and it really is a way, as he would say, of paying attention in a particular way, on purpose, in the present moment, without judgment. We train our brains just the way we train our muscles. The problem is, over our lifetime, our brain has been trained just in the opposite direction. Social media, quick flash in the pan, move, 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 get on to the multitasking. Everything that we're hardwired to do has been overridden by our environment and by the way that we educate our kids, the way that we treat our coworkers, and the way that we live our lives. So this is an easy thing to do, but it's deeply embedded. All these slide on this slide is essentially to say the science behind mindfulness is very, very strong. And again, your job, is to try to trigger your parasympathetic relaxation nervous system and to drive over your sympathetic, always on, chronically inflamed, everything's important, I've got to hurry, 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 or I've got to get out of here, the fight or flight sympathetic nervous system. I love this quote from Killingsworth. A human mind is naturally a wandering mind, and a wandering mind is inherently unhappy. The inability to focus on the person or the thing or the, the environment immediately around us, fully absorb that, fully participate, creates wandering. And with that wandering comes stress. And with that stress comes inflammation. Most of our thoughts throughout the day are just rehashing of the past and fear about the future, just grinding of the gears. The activity comes with tremendous emotional and physical cost. It's not something that I can give you. You already have it inside of you through millions of years of evolution. It's just tapping back into it. Tapping back into it by, and what triggers it is deep rhythmic breathing and focused thinking. That's it, that's it. It's a great way to go to sleep at night without a sleeping pill, right? So a little story here. Mindfulness involves a sense of unfinished curiosity. It's by Dr. Epstein, who I know. And there's another doctor who happens to be my younger brother, Danny, who teaches mindfulness to veterinarians around the country, did for a few years, because you talk about burnout, veterinarians are really burnt out. These people love animals. They get, not the veterinarian, but all the veterinary techs get a pittance for what they work. And uh, they're constantly putting dogs and cats to sleep. How would you like to do that? It's very rewarding, but it's pretty hard. So Danny took this picture at his cabin along a river out in Durango, Colorado. <clears throat> 
this is a son of one of his workers who is then about four years old. Danny took this picture and, and asked, he said, this is what we're trying to aspire to at any age. Kids and pets really remind us how to live in the moment. That's why we love a dog. They're just there. They're totally into us. They're totally into the ball. And this kid, do you think he's wondering about what happened yesterday or what's going to come tomorrow? He just said this is his first bite of watermelon. He is into that watermelon big time. And that's the joy of mindfulness is to be in that moment with that intensity in everything we do. With that comes better health. The military has figured this out. These young army enlisted personnel are undergoing mindfulness training. Why? Because they're going into combat. They're going into stressful situations to talk to Iraqis around tribal councils. They've got to be able to understand their stress levels and to treat them because we're not gonna give them sleeping pills. And we're not gonna give them SSRIs and antidepressants at night. So these are the reasons that the military stresses mindfulness training for young recruits. It's a piece of armor, just like personal protective equipment or the malaria netting or their mosquito or the malaria pills, they've got to be able to do it. So you have to arm yourself and your kids and your grandkids and your coworkers and your colleagues with mindfulness. Just remember the ABCs. A is for awareness, be in the moment, don't get sidestepped, don't think about yesterday, don't project to tomorrow. B is for breathing, regular, deep, rhythmic breathing that lowers your blood pressure with every breath, that gets you focused in the moment. And open your eyes, open your ears, use all your senses. C is for seeing things and responding more wisely. At the end of those exercises, you will know yourself better. You will understand earlier when you're on the trajectory for unhealthy stress, and you will be able to intercept, prevent, and turn it around. How do you get started? Do it 20 minutes a day. Do it whenever you can. You don't need a quiet room, but it helps. And most importantly, go to some other sources. You've got some resources there, Katie. I hope you've got some on mindfulness and the Enneagram, but help people be able to find that mind-body interface. One of your questions came in in advance. What do you want to mind-body? This is where it happens. The way you think changes how your body works. When your body's better fit, it changes the way your brain works. It's a total lock. There is no mind, there is no body, there's just Mike. And it's one and the same. And so taking a two day media break, no television, no cell phone, no media, believe it or not, you'll feel great. That's why you think COVID, during COVID, what was the biggest single resurgence we saw? People getting outdoors, people connecting with nature. There's something uniquely health producing about sunshine, the wind going through the leaves, hearing a babbling brook. It's why we're so refreshed and energized. So mindfulness through nature is uniquely hardwired into our DNA. We are biologic organisms that are hardwired to hear a babbling brook, to see natural ultraviolet sunlight, not incandescent light indoors. It doesn't energize us. It doesn't have the same effect. It doesn't do things with vitamin D. So this is just a picture of the great outdoors. You've got the great outdoors just outside your building. Take it in every day like a dose of medication because it is particularly restorative and energizing. Pill number six. I'm gonna start with a story. Truth from a five-year-old. When my son was five, we lived in Washington, DC and we had to spend an afternoon at the Smithsonian. And I asked him, I said, Kaz, I said, we've got a lot of choices. We've got to kill some time here. What, what do you want to see? I thought he might want to go to air and space and see the the capsules and the space suits. And he says, no, 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 Papa, I want to go see the old people. I want to see the old people. I'm saying, what in the hell are you talking about? I want to see the old people. I said, well, let's go see the old people. So at five years old, he grabs my hand and he starts making off for the Natural uh, History Museum. For those of you who've been there, you know, you come into this giant rotunda. There's a massive elephant right in the rotunda. Cos makes a right-hand turn. He heads, heads into the dinosaur gallery goes by the woolly mammoths as fast as he can. He's running faster and faster. He makes a left-hand turn, goes down this corridor, makes a sharp right, points before I can get there. It says, Papa, Papa, the old people, the old people. And I come around the corner and I see a scene that looks like this. A bunch of, ne bunch of Neanderthals sitting around a fire pit, eating what I hope is not another Neanderthal bone. And <laughs> what was fascinating to me at the age of five, of all the things, and we'd seen it all, 
all the things he's hardwired to see, and it's just pure DNA at the age of five. What did he want to see? He wanted to see human beings in a circle connecting. We are hardwired for the fire pit. And the more we spend time on this, the fire pit goes out. So I'm gonna ask you to think about the fire pit and think about positive psychology in the social network. The science is there. Nicholas Christakis in a groundbreaking book about seven or eight years ago said that behavior spread like infections to the positive and to the negative. Genes not only spread, but behavior spreads and they have big effect on our health. And when we are around people like ourselves, we reinforce the behaviors or not that we seek. We spend people with time with people who are like us. And by extension, should we be spending time with people who do things better than we do? So we know if a co-office worker quits that you increase the rate that everybody else will quit. Similarly, if someone's overweight or obese or eating or, or living a certain way, your chances of becoming that person increases. The human brain constantly mirrors and imitates from the age of five up until the age of 105. It doesn't matter. So I would ask you, and I would ask your kids, and I would ask their grandkids, where, how, and with whom, and what types of behaviors comprise your forest? Who is in your fire pit? And even if you don't think you have a fire pit, you do. How do you spend your time with who, doing what, for how long, and is that a healthy or relatively unhealthy thing to do? Closing slides here, and then we'll take a few questions. My heroes, Stephen Covey. I won't ask for a show of hands, but I'm sure many of the, the, our ladies and gentlemen in the audience tonight, at one time or another, took seven habits of highly effective people, which I just list, listed here. Look how many of them talk about positive psychology, proactive attitude, a sense of optimism. That was Stephen Covey. You know how he passed away? He died at the age of 79 in complications from a mountain biking incident in Utah. God love me, take me that way. Physical <laughs> activity, active to the very last day and he dies in a biking accident. You've got homework. I want you to go to YouTube and Google his video, Five Emotional Cancers from Dr. Stephen Covey. He's not a medical doctor, he's a doctor of life. And the five C's of those emotional cancers, I list them for you. Criticizing, comparing, complaining, competing, and contending. Take a look at his video and ask yourself, do you have any evidence in your lifestyle, in your fire pit, about the, uh, the five C's of emotional cancer? Another one of my heroes, I can see my mom looking at her black and white TV with Jack Elaine, Elaine, his spouse, and Happy, the dog, running around the living room. <laughs> and good old Jack, he was the originator of the jumping jack. He was a guy who told us that exercise matter. He was fighting doctors who said it didn't matter if you exercise until a guy named Ken Cooper, a US Air Force physician in San Antonio, Texas said no, uh, exercise is the pivotal aspect of living long and better. They're not crocs, the doctors who tell you about exercise, they're the good doctors. So Jack was on TV for 34 years and he will admit both he and Elaine were total snack and junk food junkies. He totally migrated to a healthier way of eating, plant-based. Um, he was an example of what you eat, how you move the positive energy that gets you to 96. The year before he died, I think it was weeks before he died, he swam like five miles in San Francisco Bay at the age of 96 and fell quietly asleep, probably of pneumococcal pneumonia, the way we're supposed to die before we invented ICUs and medicalization of normal death. So your YouTube homework for Jack is Google Jack Lane's interview with CBS News at the age of 95. You'll be inspired. You think you have a bad day? Watch Jack, watch Stephen Cover, Covey, they'll be good for you. So my exhortation to you all, you're all closer to good health, better health, optimal health than you realize. And it starts with small changes. There's no miracle pills, there's no miracle drugs, neither chronic disease nor so-called natural decline with aging. It's not natural. Yeah, we have some muscle wasting. You gotta work on the weight bearing uh, exercises. You gotta work on the bones. You gotta work on the muscle mass, but you can have a very active life, very few limitations and much less or no disease. Tell somebody your goal. 
Tell them that you want them to hold you accountable. Why do teams work better than one-on-one -on -one, than, than individual? Because you've made a commitment and you need a buddy, the buddy system, if those of you remember the military, buddy system we instill in young recruits. Whether you're flying or whether you're in the field, it's like your buddy for self-care, for buddy care. It's the cornerstone of how we do good health is buddies. So who's your buddy? Who's got your back? Who's going to be able to commit to you and vice versa that you're on a journey together? One of the best quotes that I stole from Newt Gingrich of all people uh, was how can you, every single time when somebody approaches you about something and says, I've got an idea, I'd really like to do, and the first two words out of your mouth are no because, just stop yourself and say, turn it immediately to yes if, and then fill in the same thing you were gonna say was the reason you couldn't do it. This notion of yes, if I could do this is a very positive way to turn around some of your attitudes. Use your body, your mind, your soul, exercise your soul, right? Revisit the why, what is the motivation? Who is Mike? What makes it up? And by the way, that's not constant. That can change during your lifetime. Jim Kim, the president of the World Bank, forced all of his managers to spend two days with Buddhist monks to understand, not to convert them to Buddhism, but to understand why they felt they were on this earth. As Jim told the people at the World Bank, he says, I can't have you leading other people if you don't understand why you matter, if you don't understand what's important to you. It doesn't matter what you do at the World Bank. But so many people go through life in a blind fog. They don't understand the why of their life. Put that yellow tape, it's a crime scene. Put it on your couch, put it on your bar stool. Figuratively, you don't have to get it, do that. Do the homework, watch Stephen Covey, watch Jack Lane. live longer and better and reach your dreams. Finally, <laughs> it's not the diabetes, heart disease and obesity run in your family, it's the no one runs in your family. <laughs> this is the ultimate cop out. It's not yeah. our genes. It's how essentially we were raised and the expectations or not of what is normal, right? And so with that, Katie, I'll turn it back to you and the audience. I think we've got a few minutes to discuss, uh, but thank you very much for the opportunity to talk today. Remember those lungs. Um, as we told you, there was going to be a lot of take home things you could do easily, and I hope you saw all of them. What we're going to do right now is take questions and answers. So, if anyone has a question, due to the way this room is set up, it would be uh, best if you could come down and uh, state your question here um, so we can get started. Do you need to do anything? Okay, so does anyone have a question? And if you do, would you mind coming to the microphone? I know there must be at least one. Oh, there's one. Yeah, just right. Good evening, Dr. Mike. Dr. Mike, can you see? Yeah, it's great. So you talk about the six pill prescription for uh, behavioral lifestyle. Yeah. Yeah. So you talk about the six pill prescription for lifestyle behavior. Where do we find doctors that are willing to prescribe that kind of stuff versus just writing prescriptions to cover up symptoms? Sure. Can we all hear the question? Closer to the mic. There you go. Which mic? that's you know, it's a great question. I'll give you some numbers right now nationally, and, and I'll point you to a source where you can uh, begin to investigate. So for years, like I, I was trained in family medicine, right, at, at, at UCLA, and I was so frustrated that. Uh, Frankly, I didn't see any patients getting better doing what I was doing. I was just monitoring their decline and giving them more stuff. Then I went back to Hopkins and I trained in preventive medicine, which is really about how do you improve a population? What's the essence of behavior change? How do you do all this? Um, and what I realized was it's not that doctors don't want to know the six pills. It's that the traditional medical model says that's not really medicine. 
medicine begins with the disease. It doesn't really begin with the prevention of the disease. And it certainly doesn't reverse disease with lifestyle because we didn't believe that could even be possible. So there's new science that wasn't around. Doctors have kind of wanted to know this because the internist, that survey I showed you, but they were so busy doing what they're doing that they haven't had the time to get the skills. They don't have the competencies to do it, but they oftentimes are looking for someone to help them. So doctors are now paying out of their own pocket to get certified in education in lifestyle medicine. You can go to the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. Uh, I sent the, the web link to Katie, it's lifestylemedicine.org. And uh, if one of you were to join the organization, you could get access to the national directory of doctors who have sat for the examination and are certified in lifestyle medicine, meaning they were exposed to those six pills, the six domains of lifestyle medicine. And they're very competent in helping you with that. That's one way to do it. So you can look up South Carolina, you can look around there, you can see where there are. The good news is there's 5,000 of them, whereas even three years ago, there was about 1,000. So doctors are beginning to march with their feet to get this training and education, number one. And it's not just doctors, it's nurse practitioners, physician assistants, nutritionists, because it's all health professionals. Uh, that's one way to do it. The other way to do it is if you're located near a teaching medical center or a hospital. At the University of Pittsburgh, for example, uh, I worked with the leaders in family medicine to get seven or eight family medicine residency programs throughout Western Pennsylvania to offer lifestyle medicine training to the family medicine residents in the residency program to get these young docs going right out of the chute. There are now 70, 70 residency training programs in the country offering that. It may be that some of the teaching hospitals in South Carolina are some of them. And at any event, I think a phone call to one of the doctors or to the chairman of the department saying, hey, we just had a session on lifestyle, lifestyle medicine. Are there any doctors in your practice that have been interested in healthier behaviors to treat disease? Put it that way, because sometimes they don't know the word lifestyle medicine. And even there, what you'd be doing is provoking the interest in those institutions, because they do listen. It's like, well, gee, what is this? I've got people calling me up to say they like doctors who understand this stuff. And then finally, many of the doctors don't have to do it themselves. When I talk to a group of physicians, what I typically say, how many here, how many doctors here want to be a health educator? And, and no hands go up, of course. They don't want to be a health educator. They want to be a doctor. Now, they don't have to do the coaching themselves because many of these programs, like a systemic plant-based eating program, you can't just tell somebody in 13 minutes how to do it. It has to be a sustained program. But the doctor can link you to this through coaches, nutritionists, a teaching kitchen, or stress management or program. So the doctor may not have to do it, but what they shouldn't do is poo-poo it. Oh, that'll never work. If somebody gives you that, get the hell out of that doctor's office because you're, you are at a high risk of a drug-drug interaction being on too many prescriptions that interact and one doctor not knowing what the other doctor is doing. That is dangerous. And unfortunately, it's very common. Um, one final story, coal miner, West Virginia, I've been every year going down some of the poorest communities in the country, about an hour and a half south of Pittsburgh, meeting these guys at six o'clock in the morning before they went out to the oil fields. And I talked again and again and again about the six pills of lifestyle medicine. And this is a tough crowd, blue collar guys, not a lot of education in some case, tremendous burden of type two diabetes, early heart attacks in their forties. I told them there are gonna be kids at high school graduation who have a heart attack on the stage and it will happen. It will happen before too long. There's nothing magic about being young and heart disease. It's just how long it's in the vessel. So this guy had listened to me for two to three years. He came up to me quietly after the end of a session. And he said, Dr. Mike, I gotta tell you a story. He said, I went to see my doctor for my annual physical. And my blood pressure had been going up and uh, my sugars have been going up and I've been on a blood pressure medication. And he finally reached over and he said, Jim, I, I told you, I told you that if you didn't change your do something that I was gonna have to put you on uh, diabetes medication. Here's your diabetes medication. Here's your third hypertensive medication. Here's something for sleep. He says, Dr. Mike, I took that pile of prescriptions. It's still a paper prescription. I pushed them all back to the doctor and I said, I'm not taking any of that crap. I'm not going to become a diabetic. He said, I saw my mother lose her eyesight in one of her legs to diabetes. I am not going to be a diabetic. And he stormed out of his office. And he said, I remember your videos. I went back and watched your videos. 
And I started doing a plant-based diet and I started exercising and I started thinking differently and I started cutting back on alcohol. I walked into his office this year and I walked in the office 65 pounds lighter. He looked at me, he didn't recognize who I was. He thought I was a new patient. And when he heard who I was, he immediately reached to do an MRI scan because I thought I had pancreatic cancer. He'd never seen anybody lose weight. He's now on no medications and the doctor humbly, and this is the story, and I want you guys to become Jim. The doctor turned to pulled his glasses off and he said, Jim, I need you to teach me what you know because my patients need it. Thank you, Dr. Mike. Hello, Doctor. My name is Ryan Lovecci, mechanical engineering class in 1970. <laughs> there you go. Great. Um, I began this journey because of this organization. He started with the laundry, a little much by one of uh, Dr. Joel Furman's programs on PBS. And so it was both. Um, within four weeks, starting this, my went back on here. We can't have a cholesterol check. An LDL and HDL twice a month for 10 bucks each. Wow. Have, uh, you the they come here, it's a great program. So I started tracking me, I started tracking my data. I dropped from 165 my cholesterol, that was at 10 milligrams of living for down to 114. Uh, my LDL dropped in half, my HDL, I still have struggled with that, and others 40 and 42. In four months, I lost nearly 25 pounds. I started feeling really good. I learned more and more from this organization. It's a good deal. So, but my cardiologist, I have to one year, one month in New York. Uh, and, and he says to me, I said, uh, I'd like to stop taking living tour. And uh, I told him the difference in the numbers. He goes, no, 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 you see, I love Tor. There's additional uh, benefits to taking up a Tor on the cholesterol. So my question is that, and I wasn't thinking about it because I was stunned by what he said, but what are those other benefits? Are there <laughs> <laughs> What's that? None? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, there's certain benefits, certainly benefits for the drug company. No question about that. Uh, so, so you're, you're saying, so let me give you a data point just to think about. And I, I, I resist giving any, obviously, personal medical uh, judgment or advice, not knowing all the moving parts. But so um, here's just a data point. Um, there's many, many large population studies, and I'm sure with all the speakers you've had, and I know many of the colleagues like Dr. Grieger and Dr. Ornish and Esselstyn and all these good guys, it's all good. Um, but what do, what do we know kind of worldwide looking at, at, at heart disease and lipid levels is, and going back to the Framingham study in Massachusetts, which you know has been around for 70 years now, long study of looking at people, what happens to them and, and how it correlates to these various blood tests and other types of uh, uh, personal behaviors, is that by and large, uh, heart disease doesn't occur at all with somebody who has a sustained uh, total cholesterol below 150. So if you, and by the way, if you just go to, if you just go to Africa or Asia or South America and just regularly looked at people who ate uh, a high fiber, high plant, minimal to no animal diet, certainly no dairy and those types of things, they're all running cholesterols in the low 100s. They don't need to be on another statin drug to get it to 80. Uh, and the, so I would, I would continue the dialogue with the cardiologist to say what he's probably referring to is some of the anti-inflammatory effects that the lovastatin has in addition to the LDL direct effect. But to my point, if you share with him the Lifestyle Medicine Research Summit, uh, if you wanted to share with him the six pills and say, you know, we just had this crazy physician, uh, Dr. Mike, who came and talked to us. What if I'm doing all those other five things that reduce inflammation? Is that the reason that you think I'm getting the bigger bang for the buck by still staying on a statin drug, even though I'm below 150? Why don't we go off it and see what, what happens? Because now with everything firing, that's the other point about heart disease. Heart disease doesn't just come down to your cholesterol level. 
It's all those other factors combined that add to that intima, the damage in the intima of the arteries that causes the inflammation that then makes it a soft plaque that breaks away and causes a stroke or a heart attack, right? So all six of those things, not just what you eat, but he's probably thinking about these other effects. Now, do you have type two diabetes also or not? No. No, so there is evidence that among diabetic patients that the statin gives you additional drug. But here's another statistic. 91% of diabetes in the United States is type two lifestyle diabetes. When I was in medical school, believe it or not, we didn't see much of that at all. And I was in Washington, DC, a city that is not known for healthy behaviors or skinny people. But the, you know, we called it adult onset diabetes because it never occurred in kids. We've got type two diabetes now in 10 year olds in Pittsburgh. It breaks my heart. So that's the one caveat is they've looked at statins in a diabetes population, the additional thing. But if you're not diabetic, you're well on the way to low 100s. Um, frankly, there's some evidence that statins have other adverse effects on blood sugar and things like that. Uh, it's a good discussion to continue. I, I encourage you. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Mike, I think we're going to take just one more question. Mine went so fast tonight, didn't it? We're having so much fun. Great. Um, so we'll just be able to take one more and then we'll sort of close out. Unless someone, when you are finished, has a burning question that they have to ask. So, hi, Dr. Mike. I'm Cheryl. We're up in Pittsburgh. Yes. Hey. <laughs> There you go. There you go. I tell you, I just do a comment with the drinking alcohol. <laughs> there you go. Well, I've been given that. I, um, I have a quick first question. I have two parts. One is kind of quick. You mentioned about, um, you know, the doctors not knowing what the other doctors were doing and, you know, what they're prescribing. We just all take these pills, not me, but my parents did. And I kept saying, you need a quarterback. You need somebody to monitor all this. And so I kind of became the quarterback then because the GP wasn't doing this for her job. Right, right. And so my question to you is, I know what I use to look at these the very dangerous drug interactions that I then came upon um, for all these different drugs my mom was taking. And she couldn't understand why she was feeling this way that way. Do you have one or two good drug you know, interaction websites that any of us could use? That would be very reliable with, yeah, we're taking this and this and this and this, like big red flag. You know, you have some suggestions. <laughs> or could you send those to Okay, okay. I, I'll tell you what, I will do. I'll tell you a, a real brief story quick because you guys are there and I don't mind hanging around a couple of minutes. But uh, I will send up a follow up note to Katie, Katie, if that's okay to you, because I think there's a couple of things I just want to look at the current versions and see what I think is the best. Okay on drug drug interactions. Um, and uh, so I'll, I'll get that back to you here tomorrow, probably. But the story I wanna tell you is uh, reflective of the denial uh, that exists in some of our medical systems around this issue and which you took head on, I, I applaud you. Um, when I was at uh, UPMC, I said, why don't we get together our club 18 population? They said, Club 18, what, are you, what the hell are you talking about, Dr. Mike? What are you, I said, let's go into, the, into our membership. These are all people who got health insurance. They're all covered by, by our plan. They all have access to good doctors, not only in our system, but all throughout the Western part of the state. And let's just find in the last 12 months, how many people have seen nine or more unique doctors and are taking nine or more unique prescription medications? So you get into club 18 because nine plus nine is 18. So bring me the patients that meet that dual criteria, nine doctors, nine prescription. Of course, take out the people who were hospitalized for six months, take out that, that, that. We had 1,500 people and my colleagues were going, that can't be, there's, a, there's no way. And these people are trying to go to work. They're trying to take care of their grandkids. They're out there in the community. And first thing they were, it's like incredible. We had no idea. So the median, that was just to get in the club, right? Was nine and nine. The median number of doctors they were seeing was 12 and the median number of prescription medications was 13. So it really was club 25. So then I said, let's get them all in a room and ask them, how's it going? What can we do better? Well, bureaucracy being what it was, it took me two years to get the permission 
to get our own members to come together and sit in a room like that and someone to say, tell us about your experience with healthcare. Well, you would have thought World War III was breaking out. They were angry, they were confused, they were fed up. They told us about being hospitalized in Ohio because I was on two drugs. It was the same drug by different names. I didn't know it. And I was overdosed and I was hospitalized. I have to take my daughter with me to every doctor's visit because they don't listen to me and she needs to sort out my drugs. So what you're doing is God's work. It is absolutely necessary. I give another whole talk on how to run your doctor's visit. And I tell never, ever, ever go to a doctor's visit by yourself. It's the most dangerous thing short of walking across the street in red light you will ever do. Right, and here's, here's my second part. Um, my parents are both deceased, but I have an aunt who I'm now working there with the grace of God, though I write, or it's a really good decision on my part. <laughs> and um, I'm trying to convince her that diet, exercise, like the essential you know, pills is the way to go. Um, we have, I'm new to the club, um, not whole food plants, yes, yeah, so I'm kind of making the change slowly. Um, but I know tonight we have a lot of guests here. And if anybody's even considering that, um, as I talk to my aunt on the phone, would you try to convince her, please, you know, like stand up and step in place when you're watching maybe <laughs> commercial break. That's two minutes. Just move. And so, um, like, what would be a quick recommendation that you could give us for if you're going to do the six pillars, right? If you're going to do the six pillars. Um, you know, like, how do you, how do you get into it and, and, and make the, the mindset change or make that, like, what's a, a good way to get somebody yeah. to use their toe in the water? So, <laughs> so, so here's a, here's a take home that you can apply a little bit. I love the quote because it's true. Data tells, but stories sell, right? So the previous questioner came up and said, let me tell you my story. I did this and I dropped this. I changed my numbers. I did this type of thing. I can talk all day long about the science of epigenetics, the microbiome, the big research summit that was published in this international journal. But show me somebody that I care about who did something a little different that made their life better that I think I could do. So the first thing I would suggest is take these slides because you, you've got them, but just assess and use it as, 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 let me, how am I doing on the six pills? How am I doing on each one of these six, right? Am I getting 30 minutes to an hour a day of, of physical activity, not exercise? Am I able to basically start moving towards more plants, you know, because I'll feel better. And by the way, that claudication, that firmness in your calf, that pain when you walk starts getting better. Why? Because the inflammation's going down when you get away from highly processed sugar, salt, fatty foods, uh, particularly they're low in fiber, all that type of stuff, you'll feel better. Social network, who's in your social network? Be honest. There's nobody in my social network. This is my social network. I spend eight to 14 hours a day on this. This is not a social network, it's not a fire pit. So assess those six and then pick one with somebody that you'd like to do. We are hardwired for pairing up with people. This notion and where doctors have failed, and myself included, is this. Bruce, you should, who likes to be lectured? Because it makes, demeans me, it makes me feel like I'm not in charge of my own decisions rather than rather than this big words, cognitive behavioral therapy and motivational interviewing and all these things. But at the end of the day, it's what you would want to do to convince somebody that this not only is doable, but guess what? It's actually fun. I feel better. And that's the other thing. Feeling better is the ultimate opioid. I just feel better. I've got a little more energy. I'm happier at the end of the day. I fell asleep quicker. That's what it is. And so while I like lab testing and I like people to know what their BMI is, the thing that really makes it is D. Eddington is, is a, one final quote. Uh, he, for some of you might look that, Google that name, uh, 35 years, University of Michigan expert on health promotion programs, what works and how is it tied to medical costs and how is it tied to business productivity and had two and a half million lives followed him for all these years. And D and I are good friends. We co-wrote a chapter three years ago in the lifestyle medicine textbook on effective health promotion. Because really what you're talking about is how do, you, how do you promote your own health and how do you get somebody else to promote their health? And so D would go, D said, he said, you know, he said, uh, occasionally I go to companies and I get up in front of all the employees and he opens his talk and he said, now 
I want to show uh, hands here. How many people came to work today so they can reduce their risk factors? And he said, we don't do it. We, we come to work because we like the people we work with. We come to work because what we're doing is important, right? So getting away from measurement to joy is what gives the person joy and how can they feel more of that by some of the six pills? And then you don't have to do all six, start with one because it can be, it's, it's infectious. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mike. Thank you for inviting this and thank you for providing us all of this information. We can take home and apply immediately. So thank you very much. Thank you guys. I wish you the best. Katie, Len, Bruce, it's good to see you again. Good health. Godspeed to all of you and have a, have a great spring. I'll, I'll send you a follow-up note, Katie.